Let us now move to the next section of our panel. We have with us several captains of industry from academia and the private sector who are responsible for not just understanding the way that technology is changing, but indeed creating that technology itself. So we now turn to three leading technologists who are going to share their views on what the future might hold, how large corporations can adapt to and take advantage of these changes, and what we as corporations in the private sector might be able to do to encourage the outcomes that we desire. So let's start with Professor Kaku. Professor Kaku, you've been a leading forecaster of technology for most of your career. What do you think about the digital revolution that we've seen so far? Where is it going and how might it interact with other forms of technological revolution in science such as biotechnology? Well, in the coming years, computer chips will cost as little as a penny. That's cheaper than garbage cheaper than scrap paper. So computer chips will be everywhere and nowhere, including our contact lenses. So when we put on our contact lenses and blink, we will go online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? <laughs> College students taking final examinations. <laughs> this means that my students will blink and they will not have to memorize all the things I've been talking about. This is going to revolutionize education because we cannot force students to memorize things that they can simply blink and get. And then if you feel sick, you will blink and see RoboDoc. RoboDoc is artificially intelligent, talks to you in plain English or Russian or whatever, speaks any language, accesses the entire internet for sound <coughs> medical advice, almost for free. This is going to revolutionize the medical establishment. We'll still have doctors, but doctors will use RoboDoc as an aid. And if you're in a car accident in a foreign country, you don't speak the language, you'll talk to your wristwatch and talk to RoboLawyer. RoboLawyer understands the law in any country, in any language. In fact, I personally believe that artificial intelligence, the robotics industry, will eventually become bigger than the automobile industry of today because your automobile will become a robot. You will talk to it. You will argue with it. You'll have discussions with your car about the best uh, route to take. And when you want to park the car, you simply tell your car, park yourself. And the car parks itself. This is going to revolutionize urban economics when you don't have to worry about parking anymore. And then the next organ to be digitized is the brain. You may not know this, but two years ago, scientists were able to upload the first memories. Memories can now be uploaded and downloaded. This makes possible BrainNet. <laughs> BrainNet could be the next step in the evolution of the Internet. Instead of zeros and ones, zeros and ones, instead of text, you will put emotions, feelings, sensations, memories. Teenagers will go crazy. Teenagers put happy faces at the end of every sentence. Why bother to do that when you can put the emotion of your first dance, your first kiss, your first whatever, right there on the Internet? And so in the future, when you walk into a room, you will mentally command the Internet. You'll take dictation mentally. You'll turn things on, turn things off, communicate with other people. People will think of you as a wizard of some sort, mentally communicating with everything around you. That's BrainNet. And then biotech is being digitized now. We can create a human body shop. We can create from your own cells, so there's no rejection mechanism. We can create skin, bone, cartilage, noses, ears, blood vessels, heart valves, bladders, complete windpipes can be grown in the laboratory. The next organ to be grown, by the way, is the liver. So for all you alcoholics in the audience, <laughs> take heart. We may be able to grow your next liver. So. Even the economy is now being digitized into something I call perfect capitalism. You see, capitalism is based on supply and demand. 
But you don't know who's cheating you when you buy something. You don't know what the profit margin is. In the future, your contact lens will scan everything in a store, tell you who's cheating you, tell you who has the best product, what is the profit margin on every single thing that you can scan with your, with your contact lens. And so capitalism becomes perfect. Perfect supply and demand. This means that there are winners and losers. The losers will be middlemen. Because why did Amazon become so big? Why did Airbnb? Why did Uber become so quickly so large? Because they digitized the middlemen. So I tell my friends, if you want to become a billionaire, if you want to become a billionaire, take an industry, take any industry. Write down all the places where there's friction, where there is middlemen, where there's obstruction, where there's frustration. List all the places in any industry, digitize it, and you too could become another Amazon founder. Thank you, Professor. In good futurism, that is a future with both inspires and terrifies. So thank you. Be careful. Mr. Graff. You've had to, by necessity, understand the direction that technology has been moving and then actually implement it in the context of over 300,000 of your own employees. Could you share a little bit of your experience about what it means to actually put these changes into practice? Thank you very much for your question. I was listening with great pleasure to what our guest was saying. Uh, Mr. Kaku and I remember about seven years ago I was reading uh, his first book, The Physics of the Future, and, I w and about AI, that chapter was very interesting. I read it very carefully, and it said that by 2070, we, like humanity will not be able to create uh, a global AI to be able to use. So back in those days, I kind of breathed out and said, okay, we can take it easy. Like it's not coming anytime soon, but now the futurologist, even such great minds as Mr. Kaku, who's a prominent futurologist, sometimes they make mistakes. We cannot forecast those things. We are not able to keep up with the things as they go on. So I would like to stress three things uh, which we face as key objectives. Number one, two technologies which we consider to be of great promise, blockchain. This is a technology that can fully transform my sector where I work. It can drastically change it. If you look at it seriously, at the possible consequences from the use of this technology, so traditional banks probably will be gone because you can automate all processes, especially if you combine it with AI. And secondly, quantum computing. I know that Jack uh, recently founded um, an association that supports quantum research and in Russia we also uh, work on creating such an association and we also think it's a serious uh, breakthrough technology which we should focus on. And speaking of uh, apl applying technologies today, uh, th we have this mainstream technology as AI. So AI today is like electricity, like electric power a century ago. Yeah, like, like electricity a century ago. So if in the past we were thinking that AI, machine learning, uh, big data, this is something that we'll be able to use in decision making uh, when on, loan, on issuing loans, etc. But today, basically, there are no spheres, no areas in our business where we, would, we don't use it. In financial business, we have five main areas. So, all thi first thing, all things related to uh, personal financial manager or advisory. So, bots that provide financial advice. So, when people have a standard questions, so like via call center, etc. So that technology has a great future. So maybe three, five years down the road, it will be fully automated. There will be no people involved anymore because AI is learning on a daily basis. It becomes more careful in terms of providing answers.
sponsors, etc. A second area, uh, which we actually started to explore earlier, data-driven decision-making. So that's about making decision when it's uh, based on, on the data, uh, big data analytics. This is for issuing loans. 99% of uh, decisions on issuing loans is done without any human involvement. So that's, but that's only for retail clients. And we would like to apply it to our corporate clients as well. This is a great shift. Uh, so uh, the third area is cybersecurity. Naturally, we are one of the largest transactional organization in the country. So we have seven to eight thousand transactions per second happening just in our company, and you can analyze them only by using an AI. And we're doing this. Seventy-four percent of our clients prefer the security of transactions on credit cards and so and having cash back. And so security is one of our top priorities. So all things related to cybersecurity, this is what we this is where we use AI machine learning on a daily basis to fight hackers. Especially social engineering when people get involved in the fraud by and and we analyze our clients. This is number four. So we, because we, we become more individual. So it's not like the average run-of-the-mill client anymore. But we work with the average client on the individual basis. So AI is very much needed on that front as well. The fifth area is automation of all of our activities, practically back office, accounting, audit. Uh, legal activities, all simple um, operations will be automated. This is what we're doing day from day to day. And by 2020, it, it should become our daily reality. And the last thing, it's, it's very important for us to get here together, country leaders, business leaders, and in the digital world, it's impossible to advance without collaboration between government and businesses, because every step that we make, uh, we face regulation, and we need to cooperate with the governments. And in Russia, uh, thankfully, we see that the government pays a lot of attention to this area, especially since the program of digital economy has been adopted. In this new era, business and governments will be working hand in hand as uh, Mr. Medvedev said, so the most important thing, the, the, the main resource we have is the time saved for our citizens and clients. Thank you. Mr. Greff raises a very important implication of the technologies described by Professor Kaku, and that as technology advances, <coughs> we're able to do more with less. This is going to have a profound impact on the labor force and indeed replace potentially many, many jobs. If we could now hear your thoughts, Mr. Ma, on the impact of automation and technology on the labor force, is this something people should be scared about, or is there opportunity for us all there? Yeah, thank you. I, I, um, I noticed a lot of people talk about that the new technology is going to replace a lot of jobs, and people start to fear and worry. It is okay to worry, it is okay to fear, but do not worry too much and fear too much. <laughs> and I never worry about the things the prime ministers worry about. I never worry about things the scientists worry about. I have enough headache, so I just worry about myself. <laughs> to solve your own problem, think about your future, your business future, your career is, is probably more efficient. People worry about the future because of the lack of confidence mm -hmm. and lack of the imagination for the future. Mm -hmm. I think that we don't have solution for tomorrow, but there is solution for tomorrow. You don't have this solution, somebody has. Trust our young people and trust the people in that we got 7 billion people, they are smart enough. Our kids will be smart enough to solve all these problems. And the second thing is that in the past centuries, we make people like a machine. And in the future, especially today, we make machine like a people. But in the end, machine should be machine like, people should be people like. And people should have confidence that we people have belief, we have religion, we have value, which machine does not have. And I don't believe the machine is going to take away man's job. And every technology revolution 
the third technology revolution we had. The first technology revolution killed a lot of jobs, created even more jobs. Second technology revolution killed a lot of jobs and created more jobs. We are going to create more jobs. This is for sure. And you have to worry about yourself. Don't worry about the other part of the prime minister, president, they can't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is I, I believe that most of people, they see it and then believe it. Very few people, they believe it and then they see it. These are the people called the leaders. <clears throat> so if you want to be successful, you want to be a billionaire, you have to believe it. And then you will see the future. So I think in the next 30 years, by the way, I don't think next 50 years, we should account for the next 30 years. We don't have 50 years, mm -hmm. only 30s. Next 30 years, internet is going to be as important as electricity. Internet is more important than oil. So I think internet, the DT technology, the digital technology, or what you call the data technology, is going to be the solution to solve the problem of inclusiveness, sustainable, and happy and healthy. I think today we are, the world economy is facing the challenge of inclusiveness, right? The whole world globalization is controlled by 60,000 big companies. Most of the small, medium-sized companies, young people, they don't have the chance. But internet may be the solution. DT is the solution. 80% of the business in the next 30 years will be on the internet. 80% of the business will be global. Whether you're a small business or big business, you have to be a globalized business company. So I think the world does, does not only need a G20, we need a G200. The world does not need a B220, we need a B200. And in the future, there will be no e-commerce. It's called e-business. Every business will be in. In the future, there will be no made in China, no made in America. There will be no made in Russia. It's made in Internet. You might design here, manufacture, and sell there. So we have to think about. And people say manufacturing is going to make jobs. No, manufacturing is not going to make job, create jobs. Manufacturing is going to be created by artificial intelligence, by machines. So service industry is going to make a lot of, lot of jobs. So these are the things that are going to happen, and I'm very optimistic. I think somebody will have the solution. The only thing I worry about is education. I agree with the Prime Minister. Education. We are okay. People sitting in this room, next 30 years, we are okay. But think about our kids. If we teach our kids the same way we taught in the last 100 years, our kids will be having problems. So machine is going to be smarter than us, no matter what, right? You can never compete who's smart, just like you can never compete with a car who runs faster. Machine will be smarter. But if we teach our kids how to memorize, how to, how to calculate faster, they are going to have no jobs. So how should we teach our kids? Thank you. We should teach the kids in a different way. And by the way, the finally, to be successful, to teach our kids, we should teach our kids to learn to the EQ, IQ, and LQ. Thank you, Mr. Ma. And LQ is Q of love. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for one question, which I'll ask all of you before we move to the next panel. It's quite clear that cooperation is extremely important in this context. Could you each just very briefly respond? What's the best way to facilitate cooperation moving forward? Very short answer, please. Yeah, cooperate with government. Government should not think about creating more rules and laws for business. <laughs> less laws and less rules. Mr. Graff. I think in this world, uh, so we're not able to keep up with things, it's, it's important for the government to lag a little bit behind. So they should lag a little bit behind to give more room for businesses and regulate it once the, if things are clear and understandable. So the government, like Jack said, you should have it in your imagination. They should have this idea before they start regulating. So they should get the understanding first. More imagination. Uh, Professor Kaku, what's the single most important thing we can do to facilitate co cooperation? The tendency is to cut the pie thinner and thinner. You rob Peter to pay Paul, a zero-sum game. That's not how a physicist looks at the economy. We see a bigger pie. Because where does wealth come from? from the steam engine to electricity 
to computers. It comes from science and technology. That's ultimately where wealth comes from. So it's not a zero-sum uh, game. It's a win-win situation. And that's why people will cooperate, because they see that if they benefit, then everybody benefits as well, because the pie gets bigger. Thank you, Professor Cocker. Thank you, Mr. Greff. Thank you, Mr. Ma.